We should be now uh, live on Facebook and YouTube. Um, so I see a few people uh, starting to log in and just wanted to welcome you to today's program. Uh, today's program will be two hours in length from 5 to 7 p.m. It's being recorded, so if you miss any portion, we're, uh, we're happy to provide the link to you to watch the remainder of the recording later. Um, we will be having some interactive components today, so we encourage you to use those. We will have uh, we'll be using the polling feature in Zoom. So uh, in order to do that, you'll see a screen pop up, and all you would do is respond to the poll. Um, for the questions that you have for our panelists, you would simply use the Q and A box. We're reminding people to use the Q and A box, and that will allow you to ask questions for our panelists, and um, give it'll make it easier for us as moderators to filter through those questions that we receive. If you really want to see a question taken up by our panelists that somebody else has answered, you can click on the thumbs up uh, symbol next to the question and that'll bump the question to the top of the queue and we'll take that question first. We'll have limited time for questions so we encourage people to use that feature frequently and early um, and I'll be keeping an eye on the questions as we proceed through the session and uh, we'll have predetermined times throughout the sessions to uh, address questions. Um, We'll open here in about two minutes. It's 4.58 p.m. Uh, again, this session will be two hours in length from 5 to 7. We'll see you at 5. Okay, we're just about to start the program. As a reminder, everybody, today's program will be two hours in length from 5 to 7 p.m. I see about 30 people logged in right now. There uh, is about 100 people signed up for this first portion, so I wanted to remind people that there may be a lot of questions today. We encourage people to use that question function. Uh, so the Q&A box should be available to you. You would click on the Q&A symbol, type that in and uh, you should be able to ask your question. There's also a thumbs up symbol next to that question that'll allow you to ask, uh, to thumbs up or upvote any question that you see that you would like uh, addressed to our panelists. I'm just about to enable the auto transcription, so if you prefer that feature, you would find it under the live tra uh, transcript feature in the bottom of the screen. It's a CC symbol. You can also hide, subtit hide subtitles by clicking on the arrow symbol next to your uh, next to that symbol and you can click on hide subtitle and that way it won't uh, cover your screen. If you prefer to use it, you can also show it that way. Um, the live transcript will also be available after the program if you prefer to have it. Uh, we will be making the recordings available on both Facebook, YouTube, and on our website. And I believe the OHP is going to be host uh, uh, embedding the uh, links on their website as well. And uh, the um, Recording will be uh, posted pretty much immediately as soon as the end of the program uh, completes. So you'll find it on our uh, Facebook video page and our YouTube page. This is part of a multi-part series. This is part one. So I wanted to welcome, uh, first of all, I'm going to uh, turn it over to uh, one of our panelists today, Mark Huck from the Office of Historic Preservation, and he'll introduce the series and turn it over to our panelists. So welcome, Mark, and uh, feel free to get started. Oh, sorry, Mark, you're muted. Thank you, John. Uh, hello, I'm Mark Huck, a restoration architect at the California Office of Historic Preservation. 
Tonight, the Office of Historic Preservation is pleased to introduce the first in a series of six workshops created by expert architectural and engineering professionals to guide homeowners and others who own or maintain historic buildings in California towards appropriate and current code compliant seismic retrofits and identifying sources to that end. Uh, the Office of Historic Preservation wishes to thank the California Preservation Foundation for hosting this online webinar, the professionals who created the program, and the Federal Emergency Management Agency for providing the funding. Uh, I will now turn over the presentation to Ruth Todd, principal at Page and Turnbull, to introduce this session. Thanks, Mark. And hello, Julie. I see that uh, you joined uh, a little bit late, but Julianne Polanco, the State Historic Preservation Officer, is also in attendance today. And we thank uh, her and her office for um, pulling this whole six workshop program together. Uh, so my, my name is Ruth Todd. Uh, I'm with Paige and Turnbull, uh, and we're very pleased to be here this evening to kick off uh, workshop number one of a series of six workshops. This first workshop uh, covers the basics. Previous or, or subsequent workshops will be deal, um, adding on to some of the um, information that we are providing for you uh, in workshop number one and will be participating or will involve additional participants uh, with a multidisciplinary skill set. Uh, the, the people that are presenting this evening are architectural historians and cultural resources planners uh, with Paige and Turnbull. Paige and Turnbull is an almost 50 year old history um, architecture planning and uh, preservation firm that has built our practice over almost 50 years dealing with historic resources and historic environments. Uh, Flora Chu is an associate principal in our Los Angeles office and Hannah Simonson is an associate in our San Francisco office and they are going to be carrying the lion's share of the, the load today um, in, in helping to educate you on what makes um, historic, home, what makes homes historic. Um, there's a professional definition of a historic resource, and we're going to walk you through um, how uh, historic resources are, are determined to be historic. much detail, but the, um, the bios of, um, of the presenters today and future presenters are part of the um, sign-in and registration for these, um, for these webinars, so we're not going to try to establish credibility. Uh, we're just hoping that you're going to trust that the speakers today know what we're talking about. Um, and so we are have assembled uh, a group, there are partners in this effort. Uh, as Mark mentioned, the Office of Historic Preservation has partnered with the Federal Emergency Management uh, Agency to pull together the six workshops uh, that we are helping with. Uh, and Paige and Turnbull is the lead consultant on this project, but we have a team uh, with us, structural, structural engineers from Structural Focus and Green Structural Engineering uh, will be presenting in future workshops and our um, uh, friendly colleagues at the California Preservation Foundation, including John Haber, who's playing in the, in the background today, uh, and Cindy Heitzman are helping with producing these workshops because this is something that they do on a regular basis. So we're hoping that all of the technology is gonna be seamless and John will be helping to make that so tonight. Uh, I wanted to say that uh, because this is a grant to the California Office of Historic Preservation, uh, our topics um, are educational for everyone. We understand that there are almost 100 participants um, this evening, and uh, but the focus uh, is on California and California historic resources. The agenda uh, for tonight, um, as John Haber mentioned, we, we've prepared about a, a one to an hour to an hour and a half 
um, presentation for you uh, within a two hour time frame. And so uh, at the end of our PowerPoint presentation, the formal part of the presentation, we will field uh, questions and hopefully answers uh, until we either run out of time or run out of questions. And John Haber will be helping with um, negotiating the Q&A session following the formal presentation. So we also have included um, interactions, interactive sessions throughout the course of the, of the um, presentation. And um, you will be, it, it, we will explain to you how to provide uh, the interaction that we're seeking tonight. And then at the end of each section, as we transition from one topic to the next, uh, we will answer two or three questions just to, um, uh, to keep the flow going. So as John mentioned, please send your questions through the Zoom chat and those will be monitored. You can do that at any time in the, power, in the presentation. So the first thing on the agenda is to explain the, the learning objectives. And then we're gonna talk to you about the types of historic resources uh, and then what makes uh, a, a place or an individual resource historic, because it does depend on the context and the significance and the degree of integrity of, of the resources. And a lot of the that is informed by knowledge of character defining features. So we're going to walk you through and educate you or reinforce your education about these topics. And then again, we will summarize and field questions at the end. Uh, the objectives uh, tonight are to help you all um, recognize the different types of historic properties, to summarize and describe your homes, or maybe it's your neighbor's homes, uh, significance, to get a sense of how to think about uh, determining whether uh, a home is historically significant or not. Uh, and then we will provide definitions of historic integrity and uh, differentiate that um, from physical condition because integrity is not related to condition. Uh, and then we will help you understand how to assess and identify the spatial relationships, spaces, features, and materials that may make your home historic. And this is going to be our first test of our interactive uh, activity and the transition from me to, um, I think it's Flora who's coming up next. So the first thing is uh, we just have a very quick question for you. Is your home an individual landmark in a historic district, both, or do you not know? I think we'll just give everyone a few minutes. This is hopefully a chance uh, for us to get to know all of you in our audience tonight. This is Flora with Paige and Turnbull. Just want to say hi. Um, and John, I think let us know when you feel like uh, we can close out the poll and see our results. Oh, great. So it looks like uh, we do have some homeowners um, of historic homes in the audience tonight, and uh, many who either don't know if their homes are. Uh, been determined historic or um, are not homeowners of historic homes, that's fine. I hope you'll get something out of this as well. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Uh, and we can start with the types of historic resources. So I saw that Julie Polanco um, is on. Julie, did you want to say anything before we sort of jump into all this? Sorry, put you on the spot. Um, no, uh, Mark did the introduction. I just wanted to say how excited we are for this uh, series of webinars and acknowledge the partners in uh, FEMA and the contractors and just say that we're, we're really pleased to be able to deliver these webinars to the public, both homeowners who are unfamiliar with historic properties and, and have questions um, and those that are familiar in our effort for, to help people understand how best to steward the historic homes they have. Um, in the face of climate change or seismic upgrading, just how we make our homes and our communities more resilient. So just thanks so much everybody for being with us. Thank you. Um, and we'll go ahead and get started then talking about the types of historic resources and what we mean by that. Um, and 
they really break into five different categories of properties. And these are ones that have been uh, established by the National Park Service for the National Register of Historic Places. So they do apply nationwide um, and should be very familiar to hopefully everyone. Um, we're talking about uh, things that are built that are above ground and constructed generally, um, rather than things that uh, may be more intangible. These are tangible items. Uh, and we'll go through each one just to give you a bit of background what they mean. Next slide, please. So buildings, we think we all know what the, that means, uh, but there is a technical definition to this, which are um, things that are built primarily uh, and used for, I'm sorry, used to shelter human activity. Uh, so residences and homes are certainly fall under that category as well as things like garages that are associated with that. But um, commercial buildings, stores and businesses would also be buildings as well as things like churches and schools. Uh, most of what you're thinking are buildings really do fall into that category. Next slide, please. Um, then there's structures, which is um, those that are used for purposes other than human shelter. So that can be a bit confusing. Um, they sound very similar, but these would be things like bridges and tunnels and ships um, where their primary use is not for human shelter. Let's go to the next slide. Then there are objects, which are primarily smaller in scale uh, and can be artistic in nature. So things like um, sculptures and fountains, as you see here, uh, will fall into that category. And next slide. Then we have sort of the larger scale, going from a small scale to a much bigger scale, which are sites. And that would include um, Primary things like design landscapes, so gardens and parks will fall under sites, as well as cultural landscapes, uh, which may be more a combination of buildings and things that we think of as landscapes and different aspects of things that are built or designed. Um, things like battlefields would fall under sites as well. Uh, and many of the uh, tribal cultural resources like ceremonial sites or petrographs may fall under sites. Um, in addition to all the other ones we've talked about. Next slide. And then there are districts, which like sites are a larger scale um, resource, but they are generally um, geographically bound. So things in a geographic area that um, are a collection of buildings, structures, objects, sites that collectively um, are important and tell the story of what makes them historic. They, the individual components may not have, um, may not be that distinctive or exceptional, but really it's the collection and grouping that is the historic resource. Uh, and so you can think of these things like residential neighborhoods are often historic districts um, or, commercial dis or commercial groupings of buildings. They can also be things like school campuses, um, farm sites or farm sheds that may include ranch houses as well as barns and corrals those could um, also be considered historic districts. Next slide. So now it comes to the question of what actually makes a place historic um, as we're talking about these things. Uh, and there we go. Um, and really we're talking about three items. So not all old buildings and sites and structures are going to be historic. It really comes down to understanding um, why something may be important to our, our history and that we want to protect. And the three key components of trying to understand what makes a place historic are these three things. Understanding the historic context uh, and what was going on at the time that the resource we're talking about was constructed or created. What makes that resource significant within the historic context and whether um, it has historic integrity, uh, which is some of those physical elements that ties that significance back to the historic context. So we'll go through these in a little bit more detail so you can be familiar with them. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So historic context is one of the first things to try to understand when we're looking at, at a resource and whether or not it's historic. Um, it is, really what was happening at that point in time that the resource was created. Uh, and 
it's not all history. Um, most of the time when we talk about historic context, it's not going to be a comprehensive history of everything that was occurring, but it is uh, targeted to what is relevant to that property that we're looking at. And they're organized um, around three things. Uh, three things. One is a specific place. One is a specific time period. And often there's a theme related to it. And the theme um, can be many things. It's typically re related to something like the historic development of a community, um, such as the residential development or commercial development. If what you're looking at is a home, you'd want to understand maybe the residential development that was occurring at the time. Or it can be something like the architectural uh, movement if it's the buildings of a specific style. So those would be the related themes to that property that you're looking at. And the example that we have here um, is uh, these little buildings that look very modest, but they um, tell a story when we tie it back to its historic context. So the, the, build, the photo at the bottom right there shows um, how they were built historically in uh, after 1906 in San Francisco. So that's our place and our time. Um, after the earthquake and fires to damage many of the buildings in San Francisco, the government built a number of these small buildings, what came to be, to be known as earthquake shacks, to as temporary housing um, for people. And they were built in parks and open spaces throughout the city. And once they served their purpose, um, many of them were demolished um, or moved away. And some of them then became part of the city. They were moved to other locations and continue, continued their use as homes. And occasionally you come across one um, and they may seem like they were nondescript or not that um, architecturally interesting as buildings. But once we understand that they are tied to this um, historic context, that this theme of temporary housing and emergency housing after the 1906 earthquake in San Francisco, we can better understand why that those buildings may be important if um, they are survivors from that period. Next slide. So we'll switch now to then trying to understand um, what makes a property significant within the historic context. Um, and what we mean by significance really is whether or not property represents a significant part of history, architecture, archeology, span engineering, or culture under one or more of these four criteria. Um, and again, these criteria we've got from the National Register, but, the, uh, but they apply generally throughout the country. Um, they relate to events, persons, architecture and design and information potential. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, this is a National Register slide. Um, so as I said, um, the four criteria that we've used in historic preservation have come from the National Register for the most part from the National Park Service. Um, they're the ones that we we'll refer to them as the A, B, C, and D criteria. Uh, but they're also used at many of the state levels. Uh, many states have their own historic registers as well. California does, um, a California Register of Historical Resources that use um, pretty much the same four criteria. And you'll see those uh, numbered as one through four. Uh, at the same time, a lot of the local cities or counties may also have their own registers and they often use these same four um, criteria, though sometimes they may be broken up into subcategories, um, it depends. But for the most part, um, they're fairly common, commonly used in the field. Uh, and just as a side here, a property can be listed on the National Register um, or California Register or local register. It can be listed at any of these levels, uh, but it doesn't mean that only nationally significant buildings has to be on the National Register. They can be locally significant and still be listed. Uh, but in some places um, where there isn't a local register, the state register or national register uh, is an option for people to have their buildings designated. Let's go to the next slide. Here we go. Uh, so we'll go through each of these four criteria just to get a sense of what they, that means. Um, for a property to be significant under criteria A1 for events, um, it's those properties that are associated with events that have made a significant contribution to the broad patterns of our history. 
Uh, and that can mean many things. So that could be a property that's associated with a specific event um, in time and place, or it can be this more general broad patterns of history um, that is determined when we're talking about that historic context. So this example here, again, is a pretty modest um, 1910 or 1911 Craftsman bungalow in Los Angeles. Um, looking at it, you may not know why it is or isn't significant beyond its architecture. Um, but it is the location where um, the Los Angeles chapter of the Gay Liberation Front was started and where um, the Gay Community Service Center was organized in the 1960s uh, period from about 1967 to 1974 is the period when these uh, activities took place. It was the home of uh, Morris Kite, an important leader in the gay liberation movement. Um, and so when you look at it, you may not know that story, but once um, the history is uncovered and through research, that um, the importance of the side tied to uh, the theme of the gay rights movement makes this an important site under criterion A slash one for events. Next slide. Uh, the next one is about persons, the second criteria. And these are properties that are associated with lives of persons significant in our past. Uh, and this, for this criteria, there's a couple of things to keep in mind. One is that the person would have to be a significant, uh, someone, someone important in history, and they can be important at the local level, at the state level, at the national level. Um, but the property also has to be important to them, to their um, productive life, the reason that they are important to history. So this is sort of the Washington slept here concept, um, where when we think of about George Washington, an important person, some places claim to be important because he spent the night there. Well, not all of those places are going to meet this criteria um, unless the reason that he stayed there, something important occurred. So it could be a place where an important battle was planned. That may be enough to be to tie it to this criteria. Um, but if just somewhere where you stayed overnight, it may not be significant enough to meet this criteria. So the example we have here um, is the Leland Stanford Mansion in Sacramento, California. Um, and Leland Stanford and his wife founded Stanford University in Palo Alto. But this property is significant not for that association, but uh, it was a mansion that he lived in when he was governor of California. Um, and in Sacramento for that period, he also at that time or right before that, um, was, he was an industrialist and headed up one of the railroad companies that completed the Trans Transcontinental Railroad um, that started or ended in Sacramento. So this association is with those um, time periods and that specific period of his life um, and in this location. Uh, next slide. Uh, then we have the third criteria, which is uh, typically the one that we're almost from, more familiar with um, related to architecture, design, and construction. Um, and the previous slide that we saw, the Leland Stanford Mansion, probably would qualify under this criteria as well. Um, and like that previous one, there are certain different components to this criteria. And properties can be significant for uh, multiple aspects of their design. Um, one aspect is that if it embodies the distinctive characteristics of a type, period, or method of construction, uh, which we often think of sometimes as style, um, but it can also be a certain time period that um, the property relates to or method of construction. Like, for example, if it's a adobe construction and that's what the structure is made of or building is made of, that may be why it's important. It's sort of the way that the property was conceived or designed. Uh, under this criteria, the property could also be the work of a master um, and that could be a master architect or designer or builder uh, or craftsman. It really is sort of the technical achievement or signature achievement, the work of that represents that uh, person's talent and skills. Uh, the property could also possess high artistic values. So that could be if we don't know who the designer was or the builder, uh, but the property has um, aesthetic artistic achievement, uh, it would qualify under this 
criteria as well. So the example that we're showing here is a bungalow court in San Diego. Um, and it probably qualifies under a couple of aspects of this for uh, its style. It's this uh, very consistent and well-detailed uh, Mediterranean revival style for these buildings. But it's also that a property type. Um, and these, these residential units um, built around a central court that's shared by all of them. Uh, and the way that they're laid out is pretty distinctive um, and embodies that distinctive characteristic. So, um, let's go to the next slide. And the fourth criteria that we um, think about is information potential, properties that have yield or may likely to yield information important in prehistory or history. Um, and this is typical typically used or more often used for um, archeological sites uh, or below ground sites that can yield some additional information. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and related to all of these um, in terms of what makes them significant is this idea of a period of significance, um, the time span during which the property gained its architectural or historical importance. Uh, and this ties into Again, what makes that property significant within their context? Uh, and a period of significance uh, can be a specific date. Again, if the reason that the property is significant is related to a certain event, that would that date of the event would be its period of significance. Uh, for properties that are significant for their architecture and design, oftentimes the period of significance is from when it was completed. But the, that could also be a date range um, depending on why it's significant if it's related to a person's time at the property it may be a range of dates. Um, if we're talking about a historic district where multiple buildings and structures were built over a period of time, that could also be a, a range of dates. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Yeah, so we have our next activity um, for everyone. And this is for us to sort of apply what we just talked about with the criteria to this um, residence and you may, it, your, the poll has popped up. So you may move it if you'd like to see the photograph in the slide. Um, I'm gonna read this statement significance from the National Register um, nomination and see if you wanna select which criteria you think it qualified for. So this residence is eligible for the National Register for its association with the peak period of residential development in the Haight-Ashbury neighborhood in the late 19th century. With its predominant, uh, prominent front-facing gable roof, asymmetrical facade, partial width front porch, canted bay windows, and richly ornamented facade with its distinctive snowflake centerpiece, the building is also eligible as an excellent example of the Queen Anne style. So hopefully that gives you some clues as to uh, which criteria um, this property was nominated under. And if you want to go ahead and select that now, give people a few seconds to fill out the poll. I think John, uh, hopefully you're keeping track and deciding when that would be the right time to close the poll. There we go. Ah, great. So we've got a great selection of answers. Hopefully you can see that people did um, select the two correct answers. This was significant under both criterion A for events and C for design. So you can see here highlighted the reason uh, under criterion A, it's, the, it's in the area of community planning and development for its association with the peak period of residential development in this neighborhood in the late 19th century um, were built before that. Uh, and it's also significant under criterion C for its design um, and under architecture as a Queen Anne style property. Um, next slide, I think we may pause here. Oh, we'll talk a little bit about how to find um, the reason that a property is significant. So if a property is listed in the National Register, um, you may be able to go to this website and find it. Many of the nominations are now digitized and av available online. Uh, there's directions there on how to search for the properties through the um, through their database. Um, if it is listed the office, your uh, state office of historic preservation here in California, this is office of historic preservation. 
um, and um, if it's if your property is significant or listed at the local level, local city levels, um, you can try their website. Sometimes they will have that information available online, or you can try reaching out and contacting them. Usually um, a planners can help you find that information. So I think we'll pause here um, and see if we have some questions that we wanna answer. Uh, I'm gonna see if I can bring up some of those questions as well. I see the chats or yes. they're in the Q&A box. We have a few questions also on um, social media. So do you want me to start with the one from Facebook? Sure. Um, Benito is asking if you can comment on whether or not murals on the building or on a building fit into the criteria for historic content. Uh, I will start that, but I will also ask others, including Mark and Julie, if they want to comment on murals. Um, so it depends on the mural and when it was um, created and partially why it was created. It may be part of uh, what makes the building significant or within the period significance for the building. Um, sometimes we'll see murals uh, or things that may have been advertising, advertisements for a company related to the that was in the building um, and that may be one of the features that's called out in the nomination for the for the building uh, other times murals that were added later on uh, could potentially be significant on their own but i'll let let's see if mark has a answer to that i see who popped up uh, well i just kind of want to um, echo what you just said uh, if there's any historic uh, painted advertising or uh, historic signage uh, for a former or current business. Um, that's always uh, encouraged to stay and even to be restored if, if one would like. Um, as far as uh, a new mural on the side of a building, it's a bit trickier. It depends on uh, whether or not there are any uh, restrictions on the funding being used for the uh, uh, rehabilitation so it's always wise to check with uh, the funding source and the rules to see if you know something new can be placed on the side of a building and at times um sometimes murals that were added later could gain its own significance after a period of time um, depending on if it's a well-known artist um and the again it goes through that process of uh, what's the context what is it significant for and does it still have integrity? Um, and how is it tied to the historic property? And Flora, that could be, it could be evaluated as an object, correct? Uh, I believe so, yes. Is there another question? I saw there was another question about yes. fences or walls. There was a question about fences, fences and walls, which um, Hannah, partially answered i believe or answered via mm -hmm. text through the uh, through the function but um basically what hannah said was that objects that are smaller and more artistic in nature are considered objects mm -hmm. but uh, anything else would be considered structures uh, so yes. you can refer to the uh, answer there there's other questions in the uh, q a box how can we find out if someone famous or significant lived at a home Oh, well, that will take some research um, and depending on where you are, uh, depends on type of research. Sometimes you may be able to find that through looking at historic newspapers if you have access to that. Um, that's what we do often, do a quick search and see if the address comes up rela and related to somebody living there. Um, there may be more detailed searches if you have an address and um, that you know of and you're looking into that. Sometimes looking at local directories um, can help you narrow down who previous occupants were. Uh, again, I'm going to ask the rest of the, the people on the panelists if they have responses that they want to add to that. Um, sure, I can add to that, Flora. I think other, I think newspapers are a great starting point. Newspapers.com and the California Digital Newspaper Collection are both really great online resources. Um, you also could talk to your local, um, if you have a local historical society or kind of heritage group, they often are very 
um, familiar with those kinds of things. Um, and I think that that also may get to the importance of oral history and kind of community histories. Um, if it's maybe someone in the, the more recent past or someone that may have living ancestors in a community, often um, those kinds of things are answered through talking to people, um, which is something that uh, maybe we could all stand to do a bit bit more of in, in this field. But I think that uh, at echoing what Flora said, newspapers and kind of city directories, many of which are nowadays available online and text searchable are a really great place to start. Mm -hmm. The city directories are sort of old fashioned telephone books uh, and old fashioned telephone books still exist. Um, and they are, many of them are available online. Uh, your local library may still have some of them as well. So Alan, um, Alan mm -hmm. Cooper was, uh, this is a question that comes up a lot, at least in my experience. Um, can you list on the national register without listing first on your local reg register or the California state register? Uh, yes, you can. Uh, you can decide to just list directly to the national register um, and just go through the process of that. And actually, at least in California, uh, once you go through a process of listing your property to the national register, it is automatically listed in the California register as well. So you don't have to go through both of those process uh, processes. And there are different reasons for um, listing at different levels. Uh, it really depends on your property. Um, same with local registers. Oftentimes, some people decide that they would just, uh, sometimes there isn't a local register available to them. So the national register may be the only option. Uh, and that works just as well. And in other instances, someone may decide to do the local register first uh, and then list the national register at a later time. But there really is no uh, requirement to be at one level or the other before you can list to the other. Uh, the next level. Um, if that's it for questions, or is there anything else, John? That's it. Okay. Well, I'll go ahead and turn this over to Hannah now, and we'll go to the next section. Thanks, Flora. Um, so now we're going to discuss historic integrity, which is another important aspect of assessing historic significance and historic eligibility. Um, so historic integrity is defined um, at, as having seven different aspects um, by the National Park Service, and this is um, how we, we look at historic resources also in California for the California Register. Um, we're using this sort of mnemonic device that was developed by a friend and professional colleague, Stephen Schaefer mad flaws to help you remember the, the seven aspects of integrity, which are materials, design, feeling, location, association, workmanship, and setting. Um, and it's important to remember that integrity is related to a property's period of significance. So Flora mentioned that a property may have a period of significance that is one year, perhaps the date of construction, or it may have um, multiple periods of significance or a span of significance. So if, for example, we're looking at a property that's um, eligible for or significant for association with the time that a person lived there, maybe it's a couple decades. So we would look at historic integrity within the context of that period. So um, alterations made within that period um, may, may not uh, negatively affect the historic integrity. So that's always something to consider when you're assessing whether or not various changes or alterations um, to a property ha have a negative impact on uh, historic integrity. So just to kind of go through each of these in a little bit more detail, um, materials are the physical elements that form a historic property. So this is probably pretty clear to folks. Um, this would be things like the exterior siding of a building or the material of the window construction, let's say wood windows. Um, it would also be the different materials of various kind of trim or ornamental detailing. Uh, this photo is showing some really nice um, terracotta detailing on a building. So all of these materials that were originally used in the, the construction of the building 
or during its period of significance contribute to its integrity. Um, design is the composition of elements, including form, plan, structure, style, and organization of spaces, scale, those kinds of things. Um, so looking, for example, at this residence, um, you, you can see that there are a number of different uh, features and elements that contribute to the overall design and composition. So things like this round turret um, and kind of the arrangement of these different masses of the building and the roof line, all of these different um, design choices as a composition contribute to the overall design character of a building. Um, feeling is the property's expression of the aesthetic or historic sense of a particular period of time. So again, relating back to that period of significance. Here we're looking at um, another bungalow court. Uh, these were really typical residential building typology um, in the early 20th century, teens and 20s, um, especially in San Diego. We've seen, seen a lot of these. Um, and you can see that this, the arrangement of spaces around this landscaped courtyard and the Spanish colonial revival style all contribute to the feeling of this um, particular kind of time and place in residential construction. Uh, location, this one's probably fairly clear. Location is the place where a historic property was first constructed um, or where a historic event took place. Um, it is the case that buildings are moved on occasion. Um, if a building is moved to a new location that can have a negative impact on um, its integrity. Uh, in this case, we're looking at a house, the Weddington House in uh, North Hollywood that was actually relocated, um, I think about 90 feet on, on its site to make room for new development. Um, so this is a change in location. In this case, the house was uh, maintained its orientation um, to the street and to the site overall. Um, and it had a, a pretty a negligible impact on, on integrity. But if a house is you know, a moved across town or to a totally new site, that, that could certainly have an impact on, on its integrity. Or if it's reoriented completely to its surroundings, that could also have an, an impact on its historic integrity. Um, association, this one's a little bit um, more conceptual. Uh, association is the property's link between an important historic event um, or person and the property. Um, this example is a pair of tent cottages in Pacific Grove. Um, these buildings were constructed in the very early days of Pacific Grove when it was a religious um, kind of seaside retreat area um, and some of these buildings survive. So these buildings um, have a really strong association with this early period of Pacific Grove's development. Um, and so that's an important um, aspect of integrity as well. Workmanship is the physical evidence of crafts in a culture. So this is very much uh, related to how uh, construction methods, how people are using materials, how people are working with materials in a specific time and place. So that could be related to how wood is being carved and ornamented, um, how buildings are being constructed and put together, um, different kind of trades or crafts, um, uh, specialties in, in a particular place or time. Um, often we think about this in terms of kind of the hand touch with, ma with materials and hand craft. Um, but in the late 20th century, you know, there was this move towards more um, machine driven um, materials and aesthetics. So it is possible that a, a highly prefabricated or machine age um, aesthetic could be a certain kind of workmanship, depending on the context and um, construction of a building. Uh, setting is the physical environment of a historic property. So this is looking beyond the immediate building or object itself and how it's placed in a landscape um, and in an environment. So this 
This um, is the Antelope um, Valley Indian Museum. And I think setting is really um, apparent when you zoom out a little bit and you see, for example, that this building is um, all, all by itself in this really dramatic landscape um, and has these amazing views and these natural formations. Of course, um, not all buildings will, will have this, this setting, but you can also think of this as being um, your neighborhood streetscape, how um, buildings are aligned on a house. Are they set back from the street behind yards? Are they, is it an urban environment? Are they all close together um, and, uh, you know, right up to the sidewalk? These kinds of um, aspects of setting are all kind of important to understanding the integrity of, uh, of a building. So setting could certainly be impacted by the construction, new construction of um, a differently scaled building or a much larger building immediately adjacent, these kinds of things could affect setting. Um, so before, before I move on, I just want to note that these seven aspects of integrity are all interrelated and um, a building uh, to have overall historic significance should have um, all or most of these aspects intact. Um, in some cases, maybe one or two aspects of integrity have been diminished, but um, to have overall historic integrity, we wanna see um, you know, a, mo most of these aspects um, intact. That being said, um, homes in historic districts may have some alterations to materials, design, or workmanship, um, and still have enough integrity to kind of convey their significance within a historic district. So another way of saying this is that there's a bit of a different threshold for understanding historic um, integrity when we're looking at a, a larger historic district versus an individual um, landmark or an individually eligible um, historic building. So um, for example, here, this uh, residence has a, a rear second story addition that you know, perhaps could have been more sensitively designed, but it is set back. Um, and so the, the overall kind of design and massing materials of this house are still legible and it hasn't, um, there's not a, a, a great impact on the kind of streetscape pattern. Um, but if this was an individual historic resource, this, you know, addition would, uh, would definitely have a bigger impact on integrity. Um, likewise, with this building below, uh, some of the windows in this building have been replaced with final windows. Um, and although that's probably not recommended within the Secretary of Interior standards, which we'll talk a little bit more about um, in, a, in a future workshop, we can say that the overall design um, location, feeling, association of this building remains intact, even though that one kind of aspect of materials has been diminished. So something to think about. Um, and this is a, another important note and something that is, is certainly not immediately obvious, I think, to, to most folks. Um, but historic integrity is not the same as physical condition. So a lot of times integrity and condition, these words may be used interchangeably outside of the, the kind of field of preservation. Um, but buildings with evident signs of deterioration can still retain eligibility and have a historic integrity as long as enough of their, um, their character defining features are intact. So for example, this farmhouse, um, hopefully from this photo, you can see there's definitely some signs of physical deterioration and poor condition. Um, there are some, some pieces of this uh, roof that are kind of falling off. There's windows that have been boarded up. Um, there's definitely some sagging along the roof line at the porch. So definitely some issues of condition here. However, you can still very much read the salt box roof shape, um, the kind of overall form. This wraparound porch is still here. So you can really still see the historic character of the building and understand its historic even if it is in poor condition. And here, um, this is like a, a, a positive note on this one. It was um, later 
restored, rehabilitated. And so the, the poor condition was rectified and you can see that it's, it's in, in lovely shape now. Um, great, so we're on to our next little interactive exercise. So we're going to, like in the previous section, we're gonna apply what we just talked about here with historic integrity with a few examples. So first I'm showing you this photo of um, a mid-century modern um, building. This was designed or at least built by Eichler Homes, which is a developer in California. Many of you may recognize some of these. There's many, many of these around California, um, but these were uh, a mid-century modern style um, built in neighborhoods of um, you know, tens, even hundreds of buildings with different, um, a couple of different models that were used um, throughout the neighborhood. So this is one of the typical models that would have been found in um, a 1960s Eichler neighborhood. So with that in mind, um, the question is, does this building in an Eichler neighborhood still have integrity? And, and I think Hannah, the whole, I, huh? I, I apologize. I launched the poll a bit early, but everybody can, oh, they should, they should, that's be, okay. <laughs> they should be well, able oh. to um, change their response if they'd like. Okay. Uh, um, yeah. Not, so, can, um, <laughs> thanks, John. Um, yeah. Let me try, so, uh, actually, let me try relaunching the poll. Uh, okay, here. we'll relaunch it. We don't want anyone to feel like they weren't able to give their correct answer. Okay, there we go. <laughs> okay, thanks, John. Um, so yeah, so the question is, does this building that we're looking at now, um, which was also built by Eichler in an Eichler neighborhood in the 1960s, does this building still have integrity? All right, excellent. Thanks for answering everyone. It looks like the majority of folks got it right. So we're, we're looking at both of these buildings side by side. So um, the first building that we looked at does have integrity, but this second building um, has lost its overall historic integrity. So um, I think that the, the next question we'll ask, um, John, if you can pull that up on the screen now. So um, I, most of you got this question right, but now knowing that this building does not have integrity, which aspects of integrity do you think this building has lost? And then we'll kind of talk about them in a little bit more detail. So um, again, this is which aspects of integrity has the top building lost? And you can select one or multiple aspects. Thanks, John. All right, so I'm pulling up um, the, the answer, so to speak, here. So I think that it looks like many of you um, easily identify that materials and design have been lost in this building. Um, so you can see here that the wood siding has been clad in stucco. These clay tile roofs have, uh, uh, clay tiles have been added to the roof. Um, the kind of glass um, area enclosing the front uh, atrium courtyard have been lost. Um, so you can see that the, the material, material integrity has been lost in this building. And likewise, design has definitely been impacted and lost here. You can see a tiny, you can see the roof line at least, but the overall um, kind of design has um, changed quite a bit. So it's you know, not, not exactly recognizable as it's kind of mid-century modern style. Um, like workmanship, like that workmanship can include things beyond handcraft. 
So in this case, um, some of the materials are sort of more prefabricated or off the shelf materials, but they are um, assembled and selected in a very intentional and careful way. Um, and so that workmanship is, is visible in this um, bottom image, um, but evidence of that has been lost in the top one because it's either been removed or covered over. Um, likewise, the feeling of this building as a mid-century modern um, kind of tracked house has been lost through these material and design alterations. It does still retain its location. Um, it hasn't been moved um, and it does retain its setting, which, you know, may maybe is a bit hard to tell in this photo, but you know, there's still Eichler houses nearby, still like a landscaped um, residential area. So that that's still there. Um, and this association with the Eichler development is still there, at least in the kind of neighborhood district sense. But the loss of material design, feeling and workmanship have really um, diminished the integrity of, of this building. So we would say that it has um, has lost its historic integrity in this case. Um, so we're going to do another exercise um, to, to ask a similar question. So um, these three homes from a very different era were uh, constructed at roughly the same time and with the same design when they were first built. So if we're looking at this as a historic district or within a historic district, which of these buildings do you think still has integrity? And John, if you can pull that next poll up. And you can choose one or multiple buildings that you think still has integrity. Um, just as kind of a hint in case this isn't clear from the photo, these windows have been replaced with vinyl windows. Um, and on C, the windows are original, but there are screens um, set in front. And this building has been painted kind of like a, a dark color, but hopefully you can still read um, the architectural detailing in there um, that's still there. All right, great. Well, lots of correct answers. That's fantastic. Um, so you guys are, you all are all correct in saying that A no longer retains historic integrity. Um, you can see the materials have been changed. The wood has either been removed or covered over with stucco. Um, there's a, you know, a few details left at the roof line. Um, but the windows have all been altered. You know, there are different size openings, different window types. Um, the entrance to the porch has even been kind of partially enclosed. So all of that has really affected the integrity of this building such that even within a historic district, we would say that this building no longer retains integrity. Um, and I think the majority of people um, also selected B and C correctly as retaining historic integrity. With B, um, it is true that the windows were replaced, but they were replaced um, with uh, sash, or sorry, hung window sashes and within their original opening. So that's, um, you know, fair, fairly nice feature and all of the kind of original architectural detailing and um, exterior cladding materials are still there. So this one does retain a high degree of integrity for a historic district. Um, and this building, um, C on the right, it still has its ori original windows. The screens have kind of obscured them visually, but screens are easily removable. Um, so that is a, um, not, not a, a negative impact on the historic integrity for this district. Um, and the paint color does sort of visually obscure some of the architectural detailing. However, um, paint on materials and surfaces that have historically been painted is fine and paint colors are, you know, changeable in the future. So paint, paint color um, on previously painted surfaces uh, does not impact integrity. So we would also say that this building um, retains integrity. Um, and I think that I'm not seeing any questions immediately. So I think that we're, 
we'll transition to Flora's going to get us started off on talking about character defining features. And um, we'll have, you know, again, time for questions later on in the presentation. Great. Thanks, Hannah. Uh, so this we're starting our last section of the evening. So we're almost there. Uh, and we want to talk a bit about character defined features now that we've talked about integrity. The next aspect is looking a bit at um, what are those components that can help you determine uh, to think about when you're looking at integrity too. So let's go to the next slide. There we go. So character defined features of a property. Um, I'll read this if you can't see that. Um, it says it's those elements or architectural components which establish the visual character of the property. They're typically those tangible physical elements that still uh, are on the building and help you uh, identify what it is to help you uh, see, tie the physical building back to its significance. Um, and they are oftentimes the aspects of the building that should be retained and preserved so that it will still have historic integrity. Um, and like integrity, um, character defined features, uh, the building should have, or property should have most of them, but it doesn't mean that they have to have all of them. Buildings will change over time. Character defined features will change over time. It's uh, a way managing those change so that not so much happens that the property is no longer recognizable and has lost its integrity. Um, let's go to the next slide and we'll talk a bit about how character defined features are, are expressed. Um, and they're, we talk about it in terms of form and proportion, um, structure style materials, but this is a handy um, graphic to think about it in this hierarchy, this order. Um, usually going from the bigger scale elements to the smaller details. Um, we find that at the bigger scale, as things change, um, those have much more likelihood to change the character of a building, to change its integrity. Uh, when we're talking about, for example, roof forms changing, uh, if it's going from a pitch roof to a flat roof, that would very much change the character of a property before you start to change things like the uh, wood trim around windows. So um, going order from here, when we talk about size and scale, we're really talking about, you know, are we talk, is it a one-story building? Is it a 15-story office tower? That level of scale, um, you would treat buildings very differently um, and looking at what their character-defined features are. Uh, massing, shape, form, and roof forms, um, are somewhat interrelated, but again, it's the shape of the building, or are we looking at something that's square and rectangular or um, asymmetrical or symmetrical? Um, and you know, flat roofs or, or pitch roofs. Uh, openings um, are what we often think of as uh, window patterns, um, not just the windows themselves um, and the window sashes within them, if they're wood windows or not, that would be one part of it but it's also the pattern that they have on the building. So you can think of a property that is maybe a modern building or a mid-century modern building that would have um, a glass curtain wall. That type of opening and window pattern is very different from say a more traditional design like a Spanish colonial revival house um, that may have um, a pattern of windows um, that uh, are individual window openings rather than a glass, a wall of glass. Um, projections are things like balconies and chimneys, uh, things that project from, from the wall plane. Um, they can also be recesses. So think about a, a porch that is recessed that could fall under projections. Um, and trim um, and are those uh, some of the more decorative elements uh, on a building. Uh, some will have very uh, elaborate decorations and others may be very modest, but those are all parts of some of the features that uh, you would want to look at uh, property. Uh, and materials and treatments um, is a bit low on the list, but they, depending on the building, sometimes they can be very important. Um, the exterior cladding material in particular could uh, be very much a definitive feature of the property. Um, but at other times, it may not be as significant. It may be something that um, where that has changed, but you can all these other elements 
of the features remain and you can still tell um, what the building was and what it's um, and those elements because it has so much of its scale and massing and root forms involved. Uh, and the ones that we have below the line there uh, for interiors and systems are, are still important character defined features of a historic property, uh, but sometimes they're not um, revered that they're, they wouldn't have impact the exterior as much, especially when we're looking at properties that are private residences or in historic districts. Um, those can change and the building would still retain much of its uh, character defining features. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So I think we want to go through some of these um, styles and examples of character defined features. I'll turn this back over to Hannah to go through some of these examples. Thanks, Laura. Um, so this presentation isn't um, style, but um, we do want to talk about some different examples of architectural styles as a way of starting to think about different character defining features. Um, and we've highlighted here a couple of kind of more common California residential styles, um, which you've probably seen throughout your neighborhood and communities. Um, and, but that being said, we also do want to emphasize that um, even if a building is not significant for its architecture or its design, if it's significant under um, the criterion for events or persons, character defining features still are the physical um, characteristics of a building um, that um, make it recognizable to that time and place um, when it had um, related to its periods of significance and when it um, gained its significance. So even if a building is not significant for its architectural style, there will still be physical characteristics associated um, with its uh, original construction or um, its uh, physical character during its period of significance. Um, but I'm just going to go through a couple of these examples to kind of get us thinking about character defining features. Um, as Flora mentioned, these can be pretty large or broad in scale down to the smallest details. Um, with this folk Victorian residence, uh, a fairly modest um, architectural design. However, there are many features that are very characteristic and very um, important within this um, context. Um, often you'll see things like a pyramid roof or a projecting um, bay window with a gable or a pitched roof over it. Um, you'll notice sometimes details like this cutaway at the bay window with trim over, over it, um, front porches um, with decorative uh, brackets or kind of turn spindle details are, are also features that you might see with this type of residence. Um, a craftsman bungalow, this is one of the, I think one of the more common uh, residential types in California. Um, in distinction, you see this has a steeper pitched um, or gable roof. Um, these dormers at the attic level are very typical of craftsman style residences, um, as are uh, overhanging roof eaves. So when the roof extends quite a bit further out from um, the wall plane, uh, you'll often see carved or kind of decorative um, features at the end of the rafter tails that are exposed. Wood siding of different types is also very common as are you know, wood windows. Um, front porches, either partial width or full width across the house are also very common um, in this type, uh, supported by square columns or often kind of battered uh, columns that kind of flare out. Um, like I said, buildings may have character defining features based on their architectural style, but sometimes uh, the character defining features will also be associated with their period of um, uh, development and their construction type. This is a uh, residence that does have some craftsman style um, features, but um, has a number of unique features, and those would certainly be considered character defining features if we're um, assessing this building. So in this case, um, the original uh, stone siding here is certainly a character defining feature. 
um, as is the, the clay tile, um, which was original, perhaps not typical for this building, but um, since it is an original feature, that would also be considered a character defining feature. Um, this is a Tudor revival style residence. Um, so you can see a bit of a different roof form. This is a kind of steeper pitched roof. Um, these decorative features such as this kind of decorative half timbering are very important um, uh, within the character defining features. Um, as Flora mentioned, things like recesses and projections are also can be character defining features. In this case, um, the front entrance is, is a bit recessed. Things like chimneys may be his character defining features. This does have a chimney. It's a bit hidden by the, by the trees, um, but all of these things can contribute to the character of a, of a residence. Um, this is a Spanish colonial style residence, also extremely common throughout California, um, immediately recognizable, I think, usually because of their clay tile roofs, a very common feature. Um, you'll also notice often a kind of rougher stucco texture than, say, compared to the Tudor style re residence that we just saw. Um, arched doorway openings are, are often a typical feature um, in these uh, Spanish colonial style residences. Um, so all of these, these features are the features that are important to the significance and are things that we would want to um, preserve and protect um, in any rehabilitation projects or any um, seismic uh, safety upgrades. So this is all kind of informing and working our way to um, the kind of uh, next things that we'll be thinking about through this workshop series. Um, in distinction, this is a, a illustrated graphic of a mid-century modern residence, specifically an Eichler residence like the ones that we saw um, in that integrity exercise. So you'll see like in these houses, especially the one story massing is very, very important. They're almost always one story, very low, broad buildings. So that's certainly a characteristic. Um, in this case, um, by the mid-century um, uh, garage, integrated garages or integrated carports were very common. So those can be a character defining feature um, of a residence and other kind of material and uh, form features have also been called out here. And this slide is just to say that, you know, there are many, many different architectural styles out there in California. And we just kind of touched on a few to illustrate different types of character defining features that you might identify. Um, but we could go, <laughs> we could take many more hours to go to go into these. But um, if you want to learn more about different residential architectural styles um, and architecture terminology, we really recommend Virginia Savage McAllister's book, A Field Guide to American Houses. This is a book that um, many of us have on our desk and refer to often. Um, it has really useful terminology if you, you know, want to understand what the difference between a hung window versus a casement window or the difference between a gable and a gambrel roof type, you know, this is a, a good place to start and also has a lot of illustrations. It has these diagrams that call out different character defining features and also has a lot of photographs of different types of each style. So it can really help you understand these kinds of things. Um, so that's a plug for that book. And um, with, with all that in mind, we're gonna do one last interactive exercise. So I have just pulled up an image of a Tudor revival style residence. Um, and we're gonna ask you all to um, just shout out essentially in the chat window. We don't have a, an interactive poll feature for this. So we're just gonna have you use the chat window. Um, just go ahead and type in any character defining features that you think um, are associated with this residence. Um, and remember that slide that Flora showed where we're looking at kind of the, the broad picture, big scale, and then kind of zooming into the details. So yeah, someone said gable roof. Absolutely. There's different um, steep pitched gable roofs here. That's definitely a character defining feature. Someone said the steep pitch specifically. That's certainly a character defining feature. Um, dormers potentially could be a character defining feature. 
Um, these ones, because the bays are kind of so large and extend the full height of the building, I would call these projecting bays rather than dormers, although there could be dormers that we're not seeing here. The window design, certainly. Um, the pattern of windows, these projecting bay windows specifically are really unique, a really cool characteristic here. The chimney, someone said the chimney. Absolutely. And this is a good foreshadowing, I think, for the rest of our series because this chimney has some nice decorative features. It has brick um, that matches the rest of the house. It's very prominent at the front. So it's definitely a character defining feature, but also probably uh, presents one of the larger seismic challenges to this house. So we'll certainly get into that in future workshops um, for this series. The recessed main entrance, absolutely. And this kind of pointed arch uh, opening with the cast stone trim also contributes to that. Um, so yeah, these are all really good answers. I don't think anyone has said the brick yet, but I'll also just say that the brick, the brick cladding um, would also be a character defining feature of this residence. Asymmetrical design, definitely. That is another one. Well, we could probably keep going with this exercise and identify, you know, a few smaller details. We could also say the, um, you know, two-story massing or the kind of, to me, this looks like an L-shaped footprint, although an aerial view would probably help us um, determine that a little bit better. Um, but yeah, all of these are character-defining features, and these are the things that we want to think about um, protecting, preserving, rehabilitating um, in any kind of uh, project. Um, so yeah, thank you for, for your answers there. And uh, we will, oh yes, here's, here's some answers that we just talked about. <laughs> everyone got um, the right. Yeah, good job everyone. Um, so now I'm gonna hand it back to Flora. So we're just gonna sum up um, what we've talked about uh, and answer any questions that you may have. So if you have those and you would like to uh, type them in the chat or the Q&A box, please go ahead and do that now. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So what we talked about today in this first workshop um, was uh, what makes a place historic? And we taught these three items that you need uh, to decide if some a property uh, isn't just old, but actually has historic significance it has to we need to understand its historic context we need to understand that it's um, important within that context and it has to have the historic integrity those enough of those physical elements that ties it back to its significance in the context uh, next slide uh, and this is a quick cheat sheet for you to take away uh, of what we think about when we're talking about, the, about those three elements, the historic context has to have a, a theme, a place and the time. Uh, so we're not just talking about any type of history, but a history related to that property uh, for that specific theme. Then under historic significance, those four criteria that we talked about uh, relate to events, persons, architecture and design, information potential, and a property can be significant under one or more of those. Uh, but at least one. And then historic integrity, those seven aspects with the um, mad flaws, mnemonic device uh, to help you remember that, uh, these seven aspects that we talked about. Um, and I think we'll end it there and take some more questions. Um, I do wanna say that the presentation today, the workshop uh, recording will be available um, online at CPS, uh, California Preservation Foundation's website. You can see the link there at the bottom. Um, there also will be a copy of the slideshow uh, available. And we have some other supporting materials, including some additional resources where to find this information in the, um, through the National Park Service and some of their publications. Uh, as well as a glossary of terms. I know we threw a lot of vocabulary at you today, uh, so we'll have that glossary to help you uh, with those terms. Uh, and I'll pause there, see if we have any questions. Uh, John, if you have any questions from social media, from other points that we haven't been seeing, uh, please let us know. Or if anybody has anything else they wanna mention in the chat, this would be a good time to do that. 
Um, I don't see any questions from social media, so we can just dive right into the Q&A box, which has uh, quite a few. Would you like okay. me to present the first one here? Uh, please do. I had not had that open. So. <gasps> okay, great. Um, so we have a question, uh, question significant. Where is this applicable? Yeah, this is a, a great question. So I think that the slide of this, so you have to have historic significance. Histor so you can have a building that has historic significance, but has lost um, integrity. So in that case, that property would not be eligible for listing. However, um, if one is looking at what is the integrity today? Um, so I hope that answers the question. I think a good example is that Eichler that you showed with that did not pass the integrity test. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, if somebody wanted to restore that back to um, design and those plans are available and they can do a restoration, um, it could regain its integrity. Uh, and I think an important point about integrity too is to think about why it's significant. So if it's significant for its architecture, it's, um, its design, workmanship, and material integrity would be much more important. Uh, if it's associated and significant more for events or persons, potentially, some of the other aspects like feeling uh, and association would be important, but there may be more design changes to it. Um, I think we mentioned this somewhere, somewhere in the presentation, a good rule of thumb is if somebody from that era of when that period of significance was, was to see it, would they recognize the property? Uh, and that be in, in spaces for if it's a particularly important site or property uh, or the event is really important and you can still recognize it, there may be some flexibility. But it is unfortunate we have seen examples where a property is really historically significant, but it's changed so much that you can't tie the physical building, what it is currently now, to that significance anymore. And, and I, I guess I'll have a follow-up to that is um, a lot of sites have lost very significant amounts of integrity, especially uh, from built resources. I'm thinking of places like Manzanar, um, where a lot of those resources are gone, but the feeling and association might still be there. So maybe you could comment on that a bit. We got a call the other day at CPF about a, a park where the building is no longer located, but it's associated with a very significant African-American in, in the state of California. And so it's associated very much with that person in their life. So I'm wondering, maybe you could comment on, um, can you still nominate something that has no built resources, uh, even though the, the built resources are part of that story? I'll take a quick stab, uh, but maybe Mark um, can chime in as well from Office of Historic Preservation. Um, it, it goes back to this kind of, it depends. Um, and we are we do recognize there's some recognition that there are certain properties um, where there could be a lot of alterations, um, but it's particularly important. I think it goes back to that question, is it recognizable to somebody from that time period? And the association is more under criterion a for events or persons rather than design and architecture. Um, if the resource is not there at all, I think Masnar is a good example. It could potentially be still qualify under, uh, I believe, criteria four, that potential for information mm -hmm. to yield important information. Um, and then the question of integrity, I think is slightly different than what we think of uh, for built resources. Um, but I'm gonna see if Mark has anything he wants to chime in on or you deal with the built resources much more as well? Yeah, um, I don't deal with that quite so much, but um, um, what you said sounds um, pretty good. Yeah, it's, um, there's a different, different kinds of integrity for different resources, so. Yeah, and then I was gonna jump in because I think a lot of the issues about integrity that we run into is it depends on how rare is the resource. If it's an extremely rare example or its significance is, is you know, it's not a ubiquitous research resource, 
uh, then you can look more closely about it, it might be able to have a little bit less integrity than something that is just a, a, where there are better examples or a lot of other examples of the similar style, for example. Great. That, that sort of answers my question. Um, we have a, a few more in the Q&A box here, so I'll just move